Let's join the service already in progress as we study the Word for today. The 121st Psalm was the psalm that they would sing when they first came in sight of the mountains of Jerusalem. When they were coming up from the Jordan Valley and they first could see the Mount of Olives off in the distance, knowing that they were getting close, knowing that they would soon be standing there on the Mount of Olives, looking down at the temple and gathering to worship the Lord, that they would then break out in this psalm uh, as they could see the mountains of Jerusalem. And thus I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills. I'm coming to these mountains of Jerusalem. I'm going to be meeting with God. I'm going to be pouring out my heart to the Lord. I'm going to be drawing from Him His power, His strength. And thus I will lift up mine eyes into the hills. From whence cometh my help? Question. Where does my help come from? And then he answers his question, my help comes from the Lord who has made the hills. He's made the heavens and the earth. There is not a one of us who is so wise, so self-sufficient, so strong or so capable that there will not come a time in our life sooner or later when we're going to need to reach out for help. We each of us have our limits beyond which we cannot go. Some may go further than others. Some may last longer than others. But sooner or later, every one of us reaches our own limitation where we have to reach out beyond ourselves for help. Sooner or later, you will recognize that you need God and you need God's help. That the situation is beyond your ability or your power to cope. In the midst of a powerful hurricane, the forces of nature unleashed, man is absolutely so helpless to stop the raging surf, the rising surf. When your appointment with death comes, no matter if you are the richest man in the world, you cannot postpone that appointment when God has declared that you've arrived at the appointed time. So many issues in life are beyond our ability and beyond our control. When you've reached your limits, where do you reach for help? Where do people turn? Well, there are some people who turn to alcohol or drugs. Now, these really don't help, but they can help you to forget about the problems. Uh, for a while, as your mind is under the influence uh, and you go into an altered state of consciousness, uh, you're not really aware so keenly of the problems that have you overwhelmed. The only problem is when you turn to the alcohol or drugs for help, uh, they create their own problems. And when you sober up, the problem is still there, the original problem that caused you to want to sort of bomb out. But now you create a bigger problem because soon you become dependent on those drugs and thus the problem with drugs become greater than the problems that cause you to get into drugs. Many times people turn to friends. Uh, a sympathetic friend is a wonderful thing to have, but 
oftentimes that is all a friend can do is just to commiserate with your misery and with your sorrows and and tell you how they sympathize and how sorry they are for you I get letters all of the time from people who have insurmountable problems they think that somehow I might have some magic words that will cause their problems to go away um, People do dumb, stupid things that get them into all kinds of trouble. Then they want me to get them out of the trouble. <laughs> and I feel so totally helpless. And uh, I sort of resent them sort of trying to lay the whole thing on me and make me responsible for, you know, getting them out of the mess that they've created. I have no answers outside of God, outside of prayer. But somehow they sort of feel that they want more than just my prayers. They want me to do something about it. But I don't have the knowledge or the understanding or the capabilities of, of relieving them from their problems. Here in the psalm, the picture that we have here today is weary pilgrims. They've been traveling for many miles. They've been planning for this trip because you can't make a trip like this without much planning. Some of them have been traveling for six days already as they come from the upper portions of the Galilee. And they've been looking forward to the time that they'll be spending with the people from all over the nation as they gather to worship God and the great congregation of God's people gathered in Jerusalem. Now they've come on their journey to where Mount of Olives is now in view. They lift up their heads, they see the mountains of Jerusalem, and they break forth in this song. I will lift up my eyes unto the hills. From whence cometh my help? My help cometh from the Lord, who has made the heavens and the earth. That's the rational way of looking at nature. Not to worship nature, which many people foolishly do. They don't say, I lift up mine eyes into the hills. Oh, hills, help me. But I look up to the hills and I realize God is the one who's created the mountains. God is the one who's created the hills. And my help comes from the one who has created the heaven and the earth. Today there are so many people that worship Mother Nature. Uh, they are looking at nature in a very irrational way. I have a beautiful liquid amber in front of the house that at the present time is just absolutely beautiful. Uh, the colors are changing. And just this morning I just stood there and looked at it as the first rays of the sun were hitting the tree. The colors were so vivid and so beautiful. A uh, little bit of rain yet upon them and the, and the shimmering uh, light. It was just absolutely, I just stood there and looked because, oh, they're so colorful. Orange, yellow, magenta, red, the, the, the f f just brilliant colors. And I worshiped God. I thought, oh God, you're so wonderful. Designing this tree so that at this time of the year when the leaves are falling, before they fall to the ground, you put such exquisite colors in there. You don't, didn't have to do that. But Lord, you did it just to allow me the enjoyment of seeing the beauty. But you also created my eyes so that they can actually discern the different wavelengths and, and when the vibrations hit the retina, they go into the brain and, and I can now discern the colors. God could have made my eyes to only see black and white and it would be a rather drab world. But Lord, you're so good. You, you created the eyes so that they can enjoy and appreciate these colors. 
You, you've uh, created my olfactory senses so that it, when I smell the rose, I, I enjoy the fragrance uh, and the odor of that rose. And I worship God who has so designed the world and so designed my body that I can appreciate his creation in nature. But I don't worship nature. I go beyond. I worship the God who has created these things. In our crazy mixed up world, men who are supposed to be very intelligent, in fact, we felt they were so intelligent, they, we voted for them uh, to make the laws by which we might be governed. But some of these fellows place more value upon animals than they do man. The government will support you if you want to abort a baby. In fact, they'll even cover some of the cost. But they call it just tissue. Now that same government has created laws that will fine you a thousand dollars in time in prison if you destroy the egg of a bald eagle. Now I'm in favor of any law that seeks to protect anything that's bald, but... <laughs> Why don't they call it just egg white and yolk instead of recognizing that there is life, there is the potential for life in that egg. So what kind of laws? Actually, there are laws that if you pick up a feather of a wild bird out of the woods and you have it in your possession, say an eagle's feather, you can be fined $5,000 for the possessing of an eagle's feather or some other bird's feather, blue jay or starling jay's feather or so forth. If you have it in your possession, you can be fined $5,000 because some bird may have wanted to use that feather for its nest. I know that's true. Take a walk with one of the forest rangers, they'll tell you. Don't pick up the feathers. If it's in your possession, you can be fined $5,000. You're depriving some little bird of perhaps wanting to use it for its nest. Now, supposedly intelligent men have created these laws. Paul the Apostle talking about the folly of man, he said, for they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forevermore. People, as they look to the hills, they were not looking to the hills for help. They were looking beyond to the creator and thus my help comes from God who has created the heavens and the earth. The one that has volunteered to help you is the one who is all powerful and all sufficient. And as you look at the creation of the world, the universe, you become aware of how powerful God is. And you realize that he is powerful enough to help you. As you look at the life forms, the fauna, the flora, the animals, you see the wisdom in the creation. And you look to the God who was so wise as to be able to design all of these things to replicate themselves, to duplicate themselves, and to perpetuate themselves. And you realize he is wise enough to solve your problems. You see, uh, the proper appreciation and view of nature is good. Because if you look at it properly, it reveals to you the greatness of the God that you worship and the wisdom of the God that you worship. And thus I can have great confidence that God is capable and able to help me no matter what my problem might be. 
The book of Hebrews chapter 13 declares, so that we might boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. I have God's help. I don't need to fear what man might be trying to do to me. The Lord is my helper. In Psalm 146, the psalmist declared, Happy is he that has the God of Jacob as his helper, whose hope is in Jehovah, his God, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that in them is. You see, by looking at the heaven and the earth, the seas, and all that are in them, you realize that God is able to help me. He's able to handle any problem that I might be facing. Isaiah chapter 40, the prophet said, Have you not known? Have you not heard that the everlasting God Jehovah, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint, neither is he weary. There's no searching of his understanding. He gives power to those who are fainting. And to those who have no might, he increases their strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary. The young men shall fall, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Again in Isaiah 41, the prophet said, For I, the Lord thy God, will hold your right hand, saying, Fear not, I will help you. Isn't that amazing? The God who created this whole universe is saying to you today, don't be afraid. I will help you. Volunteering today to help us. We are told here in Psalm 121, He will not allow your foot to slip. Back in the 73rd Psalm, the psalmist Asaph said that he came to that place where he said, my foot almost slipped. But as you read the 73rd Psalm, you realize the reason why his foot almost slipped was that he got to looking at men, the worldly men around him, and he got his eyes off of God. And getting his eyes off of God and just looking at his situation and the worldly men around him, his foot almost slipped. And if you get your eyes off of the Lord, you're in danger of your foot slipping. But he who keeps you, he'll not let your foot slip. He who keeps you will not slumber. When the prophet Elijah had the contest with the priest of Baal, gathering them there on Mount Carmel, building their altars with the challenge, we'll build the altars, we'll put the sacrifices on them, but we won't put any fire on the altar. You pray to Baal to send the fire, I'll pray to Jehovah to send the fire for my altar. And let the God who answers by fire be acknowledged as the true and the living God. And so after the prophets of Baal have been praying all morning long and there was no fire, Elijah said, fellas, I know your problem. I'll bet your God is asleep. And you're going to have to cry louder and wake him up. And he just sat back as they began to scream louder. And as they began to cut themselves and throw themselves upon the altar and, and all, trying to get fire to be kindled upon their altar. I'm glad that the God that I serve never slumbers or sleeps. I'm thankful when I call on God, I never get a busy signal. 
I never get a voicemail that says, please call back later, your God is asleep. <laughs> he that keepeth thee neither slumbers nor sleeps. Years ago, we had a little old lady who was a member of our congregation. She was well into her 90s. She was 93 years old. She was little, I say a little old lady advisedly. She was about four foot 11 and 93, and I think that's a little old. Uh, <laughs> she had this big four-door Cadillac, and she would drive across the United States in this big old Cadillac because she had an unusual gift of being able to just encourage people. And she would speak in churches across the United States. Uh, and, and she was very uh, much in demand because of her keen ability and all just to encourage people, a gift of exhortation. She was speaking at a church in Texas. And afterwards, this man came up to her and handed her his card. And he said, I noticed the car that you are driving. It's old and it could break down at any time. I own a fleet of trucks. I have garages strategically placed all over the United States. I want you to take my car card, and if ever you have any trouble with your car, if you'll just call me, I've put my private home number on the card. If you'll just call me, he said, I'll see that a tow truck will come from one of my garages and pick up your car and we'll, I will repair it for you. And she smiled and she thanked him, but she handed the card back to him. She said, for over 70 years, I've been trusting the Lord to watch over and to take care of me. And I appreciate so much your offer to do so. But she said, when I called for you, maybe your line is busy. Maybe you're not home. Maybe you're on vacation. And she said, I would then be stuck. She said, God never takes a vacation. He never slumbers or sleeps. And so if you don't mind, I'll just continue to trust in him rather than to trust in you for my help. Wise little woman, even beyond her 93 years. Learning to trust in God. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills. From whence cometh my help? My help cometh from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. This psalm sees God as his helper. He sees God as his keeper. He keeps my foot from slipping. He sees God as his preserver. He will preserve, he said, your soul from all evil. He'll preserve you from all evil. He will preserve your soul. Your soul is your mind. Now, sometimes maybe you think you're losing it. And, uh, but God has promised to preserve your mind. Don't worry. He will preserve your mind. He will preserve you when you go out and when you come in. Every time you go out of your house, the Lord will preserve you. Every time you come into your house, the Lord will preserve you. Psalm 91 tells us, because you have made Jehovah, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, there shall no evil befall you. Neither shall any plague come near your dwelling. The Lord is your preserver. Because you have made Jehovah your dwelling place, he will take care of you. He will preserve you. Note, the promise is to those who have made the Lord their dwelling place. That person who is living and abiding in Jesus Christ. The next time you find yourself in need of help, I would suggest that you look at the hills, or you look at the skies, the stars, the sun. 
that you look at the trees, that you look at the ocean, and you'll realize the one who created all of these things has volunteered to help you. And you'll realize he is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you might need, above all that you might ask, or above all that you might think. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? So we stand. The pastors are down here at the front to pray for you. If today you're in need of help, and it's very possible that some of you have come today just because you do need help, that you're searching for help, and you've gathered today hopefully to find help, the help of the Lord. And the Lord is here to meet with you. The Lord is here to help you today. And these pastors are down here at the front to pray for you that you might experience God's help. So we would encourage you, don't take your burdens home. Leave them here. The Bible tells us, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. And you can go your way this day confident and assured that the Lord will help, the Lord will work out whatever problem you might be facing because you've put it in His hands and you've called upon Him. He is able to deliver you and to help you no matter what the situation.